I've been in the mechanical keyboard hobby for three, almost four years now, and never have I seen this hobby evolve in such a rapid way. Today, I'll be dissecting what was, what is, and what is to come. Let's get started. Now, mechanical switches, on the other hand, you have your keycap that moves up and down on a spring, but you actually have a mechanical mechanism in there that moves back and forth to make a connection with that circuitry. Just if anyone was wondering, if you're buying a, usually if you're buying a mechanical keyboard on a general shop today, it will most likely be with cherry switches behind it. This is the Vengeance K90 from Corsair. It's made out of professional grade brushed aluminum, and it also features cherry MX Red. So the year is 2013. 10 years ago, the mechanical keyboard community looks very different. The most common and popular mechanical keyboards are the ones from big brands like Corsair with their Vengeance series, Cooler Masters Storm Trigger, and of course Razer's Black Widow. They cost about $100 to $150 and come with Cherry MX Red, Brown, and Blue switches by default. But if you're looking to branch out from these brands and customize any part of a keyboard, you will slowly but surely gravitate towards community forums. Most of the discussions there were about the IBM Model M with buckling springs, Japanese Fioco keyboards with Cherry MX switches, HHKB, and Real Force, which came with capacitive Topaz switches. And of course, the occasional talk about Leopold keyboards. All of these are commercial products that you could very well walk into a physical store and get them off the shelf. There was nothing really custom. You could machine your own custom keyboard from scratch, but the OTD community, in short for on the desk, is the only way for you to get any information about how to design one from scratch and say which vendors to go to to machine your keyboard. Unless you read and speak Korean, there was simply no easy way for the average person to get information on how to do so. Sure, GitHub existed for those in the West, but information there was very lacking compared to OTD. So there were limited modifications that people can do to their keyboards. And all of this was because of one company's intervention. See, Cherry owned the patent for making modern MX style mechanical switches. Patent works to protect the intellectual property of a company. So if you came up with a great idea, a patent functions as a gatekeeper and prevents others from replicating and selling your design. And switches, I believe, is the backbone of any mechanical keyboard that gives it character. And it plays the largest swing factor. By changing the switch, you can immediately and effectively change the typing feel and acoustics of a keyboard. Nothing else impacts the sound and typing feel more than a switch. Arguably, you can change the entire keyboard case, but the barrier for doing that is much, much higher than just changing out the key switch, which involves just desoldering and soldering on a new switch. If you want to create an entire case, you've got to purchase and learn how to draw in a CAD software like say SOLIDWORKS or Fusion 360. Contact a vendor for a code on your design, refine your design, and only then can you receive a new keyboard case. Unless you are running a business, these require a tremendous amount of effort. To add fuel to the fire, Cherry only deals with large enterprises like Corsair and Razer, who pay huge amounts of money in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get them into all of their keyboards. There was no easy way for an average consumer like you and I to get our hands on a small quantity of 100 to 200 switches for a personal build. Therefore, until their patent expired and went into the public domain officially, there was little motivation to innovate from individual hobbyists. It was a very boring time to live in, as a keyboard enthusiast myself. The build quality is outstanding. Metal keyboards, those are just some of the best feeling keyboards. They feel rigid, solid, there's no creaking, no flexing to them. Simply put, it's a work of art. The 89 gently concaved keycaps are cut from a single panel of wood with their relative position preserved such that the natural wood grain pattern is visible. So there you have it. It is uh, a wonderful little device. It does what it says it's gonna do. It's a mechanical keyboard, which is slim and uh, portable. So fast forward to 2019, the design of Cherry MX style switches is no longer a secret, and it became the de facto design to use in almost all custom mechanical keyboards. Offshoots like Taxi, JWK, Gateron, and Kill began manufacturing their own series of mechanical switches that extend well beyond the simple red, brown, and blue switches. It basically broadly classifies linear, tactile, and clicky switches. Gateron, Milky, and Ink Housings were the craze, while Kale stood out with their box design of switches. More importantly, you can get them in small quantities, down to about 10 per pack. This revolution in switch design and increased accessibility gave people the courage to try new things with their keyboards. 
So if this little thing can make such a huge difference in the keyboard's typing feel and acoustics, what else can be modified? So keyboards, for example, they come in hot swap, solder, flash cards or not, Bluetooth connectivity or not. Plates nowadays also come in many variants like brass, aluminum, flexible polycarbonate or palm. Mounting patterns involve from um, pre-mount, top mount, gasket mount, sandwich mount, and wall mount. I'm joking on the last one. And of course, keyboard and keycaps design. Most importantly, aside from these hardware variations, the adoption of QMK or VIA tools as a standard played a huge role in keyboard innovation. QMK is an abbreviation for Quantum Mechanical Keyboard, while VIA is well, VIA. Both are programs that allow you to build your own keymap and firmware to flash into the microcontroller of a keyboard, or in other words, the brains of a keyboard. Therefore, if you want your F1 button to function like backspace for whatever reason, you can use these programs to do so very easily. Now this is huge, because it means that if you design a keyboard that deviates from a normal full-size keyboard, like a 10 keyless or 60% with a smaller footprint, you can let people map the keys however they like, very easily without even learning how to code a single line. A whole other dimension of design variables just opened up, allowing further customization of your keyboard. You might think that this software costs a ton, right? Here's the thing. I find it so heartwarming that these are not only developed voluntarily, they were made available for free by members of the community, just so that others can enjoy the experience of using a personalized keyboard. These developments are akin to how the internet was originally founded. It was all out of a pure desire for the inventors to share knowledge freely and easily. Most brought to light financial troubles faced by Max & Co as a result of overextending themselves, fulfilling minimum order quantities of group buys in order to meet demand in a hope they can turn a profit when the extras came in stock. Bearing in mind that the hobby has slowed down a lot in popularity since lockdown lifted, the inherent demand for these sets has diminished and so stock is not selling out nearly as quickly as it was a few years ago. Looks like yet more vendors, plural, are looking bad this month. Project Keyboard has remained radio silent for months, more so than Max & Co have which is extremely telling, with many outstanding group buys, some of which were already delivered last year from other proxies. This year was a horrendously down year. The dark days of COVID is finally over and everyone went back to their offices. The mechanical keyboard that you built over the last couple of years is now sitting at home collecting dust. Worse, what you ordered three years ago may not even have been delivered to you. Interest in mechanical keyboards hit rock bottom. As demand fell sharply, keyboard vendors who overleverage their assets are feeling the hit. Where I am in Singapore, although Hex Keyboards is indeed staying true to their promises, the ex-owner of Hex Keyboard left a massive debt and mess for Caster, their successor, to clean up. Mess & Co was the first to fall globally, followed by Project Keyboard and many others. All these unscrupulous vendors severely discouraged people from buying the latest creations these days since almost every design ran through a group buying system where you pay upfront to a vendor who then in turn pays a manufacturer to fabricate a keyboard or keycaps. So, you will only see your keyboard much, much later. In these cases where the vendors didn't have good cash flow, they go bankrupt and you won't even get your keyboard order at all. I have to confess that sadly, I too fell victim. In my case, I didn't receive my order for the Sunsetter from Carol Design. The Sunsetter met with a lot of QC issues, which weren't handled well by the manufacturer. And as unhappy customers forced refunds and chargebacks through their credit card, Carol went into severe debt and mental health issues. It was bad enough to the extent that he was straight up ignoring his relatives and close friends. Can you imagine ignoring your brother or sister who also invested in the company? It is your blood kin, it's not some random keyboard warrior typing behind a screen. Another group by horror story I've heard is about Noxery. Noxery is a keyboard manufacturer who faced significant setbacks and customer discontent during their group by projects, particularly with the X60, V2, and Evija models. The origins of these keyboards were suspicious to begin with, and some were saying that it was a cash grab and a copy of the heavy grill keyboard designed by Ryan from Nobawa. Anyway, the initial proposed timeline kept meeting with prolonged delays, beginning with the group buys uh, start in December of 2021 and hampered by issues until 2023. The first red flag was that after the group buy ended, it was complete radio silence for the first half of 2022. 
Issues allegedly emerged during manufacturing, including unexpected stretches on the keyboards, prompting a production pause. Logical, but Noxury did not communicate transparently about these defects at all. Despite promises of updates and production progress, customers received no visual evidence or satisfactory explanations. There was no pictures, there was no videos, there was no description of any follow-up actions by Noxury. That's the second red flag. The third and last red flag was when Noxury delivered defective products, even after taking prolonged periods of time to allegedly fix QC issues. The final straw, the real final straw, was when Noxury kicked people out of this Discord server when they brought up any concerns at all, even went through their comments and deleted them one by one. Absolute dictatorship and censorship. With all these horror stories, it's not hard to imagine why incumbent hobbyists stopped trusting vendors and stopped participating in group buys altogether. The future really looks bleak. Or does it? Regardless of the lack of trust in the overall macro environment, I strongly believe that if there's a good enough product, people will still be willing to fork out their hard-earned money to purchase it. So let's take a look at what's happening with keyboard innovation. The current trend of keyboard designs involves equipping it with a knob or a screen of sorts. The Satisfaction 75 was, I believe, the one that did it the earliest, and since it was done very tastefully, it was quite a popular keyboard. Quite a bit later, Mellatrix and QWERTY keys hopped on the train and even incorporated knobs and screens into their latest iterations of their QK and Zoom variants. So I don't see this trend dying anytime soon. Knobs and screens are certainly highly functional, but honestly, in my opinion, it's getting too common. Aesthetically, it might not be pleasing for everyone, so I can see why not every keyboard has one. It's not just this though, I expect to see more unique features to be built in. Like the Tenet 70, which has a flippable, swappable, uh, rotatable PCB that lets you flip the layer of a keyboard. There's another YouTube video of a guy in the Chinese community who definitely took customization to a whole nother level by adding not only a fingerprint sensor, he added a rotary encoder, an e-ink display, and the entire keyboard is modular. If you don't like the rotary encoder, just don't install it. If you want a fingerprint sensor, just install that. He definitely took the word customization to a whole nother level. I'll link his video in the description so you can take a look at this amazing project. I digress, but he also went on to start a company featuring humanoid robots as their core technology. <sighs> like, absolutely mind blown. Therefore, you can see that on the keyboard innovation front, there are so many interesting and new ideas that have yet to be explored. Not only that, if you talk about keyboards, you have to talk about the artistic flair that is being injected into keyboard design. And I would like to mention two studios that I have been closely keeping tabs on. One is Work Technica, who I believe is absolutely hitting it out of the park. I bought the Work One, the first keyboard that they designed, and I'm pretty sure I'll have a blast building it, so stay tuned for that. It has a very nice curve which gives it the illusion that you're typing on a futuristic keyboard. The entire bottom case is also a weight in itself, which is a great canvas for patina. Their next creation, the Work Triad, seems to be a banger as well. <laughs> they are really really going for my wallet. Another design studio to keep an eye on is Guy's Machine, with their absolutely futuristic and abstract keyboard design. Do you really need a circular appendage at the front of the keyboard? 100% no. But does it look unique on the Geist? For sure. If anything, it is eye-catching enough and a definite art piece for any collector. So if you see a keyboard is just an over-engineered rectangle, I believe and I counter-argue that these two designers are clearly showing that they are trying real hard to break this rectangular label. Keyboards are gradually becoming an essential tool for productivity. If not, they can just be a masterful art piece put on the shelf. Okay, so the future of keyboard design and innovation seems pretty bright. Taking a look at the keycap segment, many of the remaining vendors frequently run sales and give huge discounts. Another good thing is that when prices are coming down, it means that people are less tempted to buy clones. So these will be slowing down off as well. A very welcome sign because I absolutely hate clones. Not to mention the multitude of brands that have joined the fray, like PPT fans that has been absolutely killing it since their beginning. Oh, and use the link in the description for your KPD fans purchases. That will mean a lot in supporting what I do in this channel. Um, where was I? Ah uh, yes, speaking of prices, overall, they are decreasing across the board as keyboard makers like QWERTY Keys and Manatrix offer very good quality keyboards at very affordable prices. Like QWERTY Keys Neo 65, which is a sub-$100 keyboard with beautiful weight and premium feel to it. 
I also daily drive the Zoom TKL at work and I haven't gotten a signal of that keyboard yet, which says a lot coming from me having built so many keyboards on this channel. Sadly, group buys are still here to stay as the hobby as a whole is very small in size and market volume. There really isn't one company that is dominating this space. Small design studios and individual designers simply don't have tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay manufacturers upfront and get the large inventory of in-stock keyboards and keycaps. It's simply too much risk and financial burden to bear on a single person or a few people. Fortunately, there has been talks of the implementation of a vendor rating system, which will hopefully allow buyers old and new to judge how credible a group buy vendor is. So there is hopefully a reduced risk of exit scams and rug pulls. On another note, don't get me started on the whole slew of gorgeous artisans and boutique keycap makers. There are so many aspects that have yet to be discovered and explored. This hobby isn't just about typing tests, flipping keyboards, and hustling keyboards. There's a whole history, science, and design aesthetics that have yet to be expounded on, and I'm really, really excited for what's to come. All right, so I'm more or less done. I hope I'll be seeing you around years down the road talking about how this era was so monumental. See ya.